we'll start the yes i, I will start the presentation now uh, the the correct perception process most people will not think about this question because they're so sure that they are uh, they, they 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 feel that they they don't answer uh, what is the correct perception process most people will not uh, think about the answer to this question because they're so sure that they've been taught by science right from the childhood days that the correct perception process is what science is teaching them and what does science teach about the perception process it shows that there's an image out there and this image falls on the retina and the image from the retina goes into the uh, virtual one minute sorry just one minute. let me admit all of them yeah i'll let you in and let me make you the host can just one minute let me make my wife the host and then she can I sincerely apologize for the delay. Um, so the science, uh, what does science teach about the perception process? It teaches that the light from a source falls on an object and the reflected light from the object moves from the object towards the retina. And in the retina, there are about 120 million rods and there are 6 million cones. The rods are sensitive to the monochrome light and the 6 million cones are sensitive to color light. The optical signal from the uh, retina goes to the visual cortex. And from there, what happens? Science has no clue. It goes into the visual cortex. And how is the image created? How do you decode the image or the signal which is coming from the retina to recreate that image uh, to form there? Science has comes to an end there. So science has a lot of limitations there. And Vedanta teaches a completely a different philosophy. Vedanta teaches there is content in the mind and this content from the mind is projected out there. So you can see the difference. Science is teaching there's a universe out there and the image from the universe comes into your uh, visual cortex. And then you see inside your teachers a completely different philosophy. It talks about there's a, already a fully functioning universe within your mind, and that is projected out there. So which is correct? So we'll try to answer this question in this webinar. So what Vedanta teaches is the only uh, truth. And we will see that by seeing the limitation of the perception process as taught by science, We'll also see why is the projection of the universe the only reason. We'll give five different reasons based on logic and science. And then we lastly will cover how to the step-by-step -step process, how exactly the projection works basically. So let's see what are the limitations of the perception process as taught by science. There are many limitations. First of that is isn't there too much dependence upon the reflected light. Like I mentioned earlier, a light from a source falls on an object. If the object is a green object, a reflected light from that object would be a red, a green light coming out. If there was a red object, a red light would come out as a reflected light. And that reflected light is sent towards your retina. So a full understanding of the universe out there, all the objects you see out there is dependent on this reflected light. I feel there's too much dependence on this single reflected light is where the universe, you see the universe just because of the reflected light. This, the object by themselves don't emit light. It's a reflected light which is coming across there. So you can see there's too much dependence on the reflected light. What power does the reflected light by which we can see the universe there? So I think there's too much dependence. Secondly, photons on demand now. For example, you look at a star, which is 500 million years away. So it's, the photon is traveling for 500 million years from that star towards you. And just to give you a perspective, uh, the dinosaurs roamed this earth, on Earth 250 million years. So this photon has been traveling for 500 million years to reach you. It's an amazing uh, thought itself. 
how could we a photon be traveling that much distance to see you? And that is a fact. That's what science teaches. And that photon is coming for 500 million years. It hit, hits your retina, and then you observe that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the star there. Now suddenly, about for example, now if you look at uh, 180 degrees away, you look at another star. That star light is taking 10 years to reach you from the star there. Then you look at another uh, location of uh, the sky where the star may be 100 million years. So that photon has been traveling for 100 million years to reach you. And just for example, if millions of people are watching that same star at the same time, can you imagine all the photons from all the objects are available at you at, at the same time? So it almost seems like the photon is on demand. Whenever you want to see an object, the photon is already available at you. That makes it very intriguing because you know that photon has traveled 500 million years to reach you, but still it is available at you at whenever you want it. You change your direction of the stars, you see a tree near, near you, you see the photon has already uh, reached you. You see a object which is further away, that photon is already available at there. If you look at the sky and the, and the star, which is 100 million light years, light years away, that photon is already available. So it always seems that photons are available already here and everywhere. And that makes you wonder if a photon has to travel 500 million years, how is it available at the moment when you want it? Won't it be taking some time for it to reach you? No, the photon is already here. And that's what intrigues me. And that's why I feel there's a drawback for the current perception process. Next point is the integrity of the photon is questionable. When the reflected light, which is a green light coming out from a green object coming towards you, it has to maintain its integrity. It has to maintain its uh, intensity. It has to maintain this wavelength. It has to maintain its frequency so that it can reach the uh, retina with great accuracy. When you have a, a star which is 500 million light years away, you can question how is the integrity of that photon maintained. It has to travel 500 million years to reach you. And during that time, it can interact with other objects on the way, even if you say space is empty, but when it enters Earth's atmosphere, there is so much activity in the Earth's atmosphere, it can definitely change frequency, it can interact with other photons, it can, anything can happen, but it doesn't seem to be happening. It, it seems to be, the, the integrity has to be pure. And secondly, you might say that space is empty, so they may not have anything there, which is the fact. But now recently science has found out just below the surface of the uh, uh, space, there is a thing called vacuum energy, which is uh, the coating of the space. And this vacuum energy is bubbling with life. It's got so much energy inside it, just below the surface. And this energy by itself creates photons. It, it creates new photons. It gets destroyed. New photons are created. New photons get destroyed. And that's the journey of this photon, which is traveling from such a far away star. With that sort of environment, how does a photon maintain its integrity? That's a question mark. I always wonder how can the photon can maintain its integrity of frequency, intensity, and wavelengths. Even if we assume, the other question to wonder, do photons have memory? The, the light has been traveling for 500 million years. So when it reaches a retina, the photon has to tell the retina, I've come from 500 million years. My photon, which you're seeing, I'm 500 million years. There may be a photon which is coming from a tree, which is 100 feet away. That photon has to, when it reaches a retina, the photon must know that I've come only from 100 feet. Or if there's a star, which is like the sun, uh, the, what do you call the uh, photons coming from the sun, it traveling eight minutes. So how does the photon track the distances travel? But it has to, otherwise, how would you know when it hits a retina that this photons, because like I mentioned to you, there are 120, uh, 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 what do you call rods uh, on your, in your retina. So each uh, 120 photons, have, million photons have to hit your eye. And each photon must have some distance, a uh, memory in it. Otherwise, how would the retina know from where the photon has come from. When we assume that the photon has some sort of memory and science doesn't know about it, it has to transfer that information to the retina. So the optical signal which is created in the mind, it has to know 
from where the photon is come, what distance the photon is, when he has to recreate that image in your mind, it has to recreate, it has to know the distance so that you know that photon has come far away. So it has to show you that it has come from far away. So the photon, it's intriguing to, intriguing to find out, does photon really have memory? I don't think science has ever told us that the photon has memory, but logically it should have memory. Otherwise, how would you know from where the photon has come there? So these are some question marks which leave the limitations of the current perception process. Lastly, another very interesting, intriguing thing is that you have the universe out there and the light from that universe is coming to your retina and that optical signal is created in your, goes to your visual cortex. And from there, an image has been created. Does that mean there are two images? One is the image of the object which is out there in the world and the other image which is in your mind, basically. We don't feel that way. We, we only feel there's only one image. What is that image? Is it the image of your mind which has been projected out there? Or is it, where is that image? Where is the image which is coming from the light there? So there are a lot of question marks which are unanswered in this uh, uh, perception process which are taught by science. And I strongly believe what science is teaching has many limitations. It doesn't really uh, give you a correct perception how exactly we perceive the universe out there. The other thing is um, photons do not travel. It may be a very uh, bold statement, but it is a fact that photons do not travel. It depends on whose perspective you see. The theory of Einstein theory of relativity will show you that the photons do not really travel by cell. How to understand this? We, if we have a basic understanding of the Einstein theory of relativity, it says faster the motion, slower the time. Wherever there's motion, time slows down. Faster the motion, slower the time. If you reach the speed of light, there'll be no time, there's no space. Science, uh, Einstein always had a, a fantastic, what do you call, um, thought experiment, where he had two twin brothers, one twin brother is on the earth, the other twin brother sits on a rocket, and he travels in the rocket at 80% speed of light. He travels around and comes back to earth. The person on earth, he feels, that the person uh, that uh, the time 10 years have passed, but the person in the rocket feels he has only traveled for six years because he's traveling at 80 percent the speed of light. The faster you go, the slower will the time be. If he goes at 99.99 percent speed, he will only feel he has only traveled for 50 days as compared to 10 years on Earth there. So it has a very interesting relation between time and uh, and speed, motion and speed. But when you reach the speed of light. There is no time, there is no space. If that rocket, uh, and what is the thing which travels at the speed of light? The only thing we know which travels at the speed of light are photons, basically. We see photons zipping around at the speed of light all over the world, all over the universe, photons are zipping away. But if you put a camera on a photon, what would the photon see? Photon will see because it's traveling at the speed of light, it will see there is no time, there is no space. The photon does not feel time, the photon does not feel space. You as an observer of the photon will see the photon zipping away at the speed of light. As the same way as the rocket, as if it is going at the speed of light, you can see the rocket going at the speed of light. But the rocket itself would feel it's not traveled at all. This is an intriguing illusion which is created by nature that uh, the photon, you may see the photon traveling at the speed of light, but the photon by itself if we put a camera on the photon, the photon will not see anything. It will not see space. It will not be, see time. So where is something which is where there is no space and where is no time? It cannot be in, in space time, basically. It has to be outside. And what is outside space time? The only thing which is outside space time is your inner core. Your inner core is where this photon is sitting. And also science tells you that anything which is traveling at the speed of light has infinite energy. So this photon is sitting in your inner core at the speed uh, uh, and it has infinite energy. So the photon by itself from his own perspective does not travel. You will see the photon traveling at the speed of light on an observer, but the photon doesn't travel. And this is an amazing illusion which is created by nature basically. So the photon doesn't travel. So projection is the only truth there. So we're going to show you in different ways why projection 
of this universe is the only truth. We'll be using science, we'll be using logic, we'll be using some maths, we'll be using some quantum physics and by analyzing objects there. Let's start by analyzing uh, why projection is only truth by science. If you really see the Einstein theory of relativity, it clearly shows that each one is creating their own space there. It is within the science, this theory. Let's try to understand this theory. And I'll show you that's just a question of how you understand and interpret the theory of relativity. It will clearly show that uh, the projection is the only truth. Let's try to understand this now. Like I mentioned earlier, wherever there's motion, time slows down and space contracts. The faster you go, slower, uh, the time will slow down and space will contract. That is a fact. Faster the motion, slower the time. Can I ask you a question? Do you see motion? Motion is everywhere. You see an ant crawling. There's someone who's sitting on a chair, not moving. There's someone walking. There's someone running. Someone going on a cycle. Someone is going in a car. Someone is going in a plane. Someone is going in a rocket if it is there. So each one is going at different speeds. So what the uh, theory of relativity says, if there is different speeds, means each one clock is ticking at a different rate. If a person is walking compared to the person sitting, since the person is walking, his, he has motion, his time will be clicking at a slower rate than the person sitting in the chair. The person running away, running, or running at a higher speed, his clock would be ticking at a much slower speed as compared to the person walking. The person going in a cycle, he's going faster than the person running, so his clock will be ticking at a slower rate. This ticking of the clock is so minute that you will not be able to notice in your lifetime. But in terms of nature, the clock has slowed down. That is a fact of the nature. Because nature works in a different time scale at all. And our mind and uh, our perception cannot make a difference at all. It is so small, the time difference, it, uh, you cannot make a notice. They say that if you keep running all your life, you may save one second in your, uh, in your, uh, your age sort of thing. Because that's much what how much the time would... Uh, but the fact is, space has been created for each individual person. So if someone is walking and someone is running, his space is completely different. His time is clicking at different, uh, different rates. His space, his size is different. So he has an in independent space. So this clearly shows that each one creates their own space. And this fact is proven by the Einstein theory of special relativity. It is within there. It is a question how you interpret it. Since there is motion, time slows down. And wherever there's motion, time slows down. If the motion is fast for one person and slow the other person, their clocks are ticking differently, basically. But they're so small that you will not make any difference. But the fact is, it is each one is creating their own space. So the Einstein theory of special relativity clearly shows that each one is creating their own space. Let's use some logic now. The question is, where is the starting point of space? It's not an easy question to answer because you see space everywhere and you need to find a point in space which is non-moving. The non-moving point would be the start of space there. So where is the non-moving point? Let's try to hunt down this non-moving point of space with this diagram in front of you. You have a star which is 5 million years away. So light is going to take 5 million years to reach from the star. Then you come closer to, closer to us, the sun which is about light will take eight minutes to reach us from the sun. Then we take the moon, light will take three seconds to reach us. So you can see as the distance is uh, closing down, the light is taking less time to reach us basically from the source. If you take a plane flying at 30,000 feet, uh, 30, feet, light will take three milliseconds to reach us. If you see a tree outside your window, light will take, which may be about 100 feet, light may take 10 to the power minus six seconds to reach you. If you have your laptop or your smart device in front of you, light will take 10 raised to power minus nine seconds. So you can see as the distance is coming down, light is taking uh, less time. So where is the point where light will take zero seconds to reach us? Just think about it. It obviously, the observer within you, where light will take zero seconds to reach us. So that observer within you is a starting point of space basically. So now this logic I've used, for myself, for my objects. Now you can use the same reasoning for your objects around you and you will also come to the conclusion that the space 
starts with the observer within you. So the conclusion is the space starts for every observer. Every observer can use the same logic and this uh, they'll come to the same conclusion that space starts with each individual observer within you. So if this is true, that means you are starting your own space. I'm starting my own space and everyone is starting their own space basically. So this clearly shows that if everyone is creating their own space, it means projection of this universe is the only truth basically. So by this logical reason, we have seen that each one is creating their own space. We can also prove it by mathematics, by understanding the Hubble's constant there. We will not go into too much detail here, but Hubble's constant is a constant which has been observed. If you look at a star, which is about 3.3 million light years away, and if you look at the how fast that star is moving away from the observer, they find it is at 72 kilometers per second. That's called the Hubble's constant. It means any object which is 3.3 million light years away from you, that particular object will be moving away from you at a speed of 72 kilometers per second. And that's an observed fact and a proven fact. But there is no mathematical proof for this. How do you prove that? But if you use a framework of space, like I mentioned earlier, that the starting point of space is your observer and the outer edge of the universe is the uh, outer edge, which is 13.7 billion years away, which is the outer edge of the universe. The outer edge of the universe is expanding at one light year. And that is a proven fact, basically. So if we use proportional mathematics, if the outer universe at 13.7 billion years is expanding at one light year, so how much is the expansion of a star or an object, which is 3.3 million light years? The answer is 72 kilometers per second. So you can prove it by maths that the framework of the universe is as follows. The starting point of the space is the observer within you. And the Hubble's constant also proves it mathematically that the starting point of space is the object, uh, is the observer within you. So this is another proof for to show that each one is of us is projecting the universe. By quantum physics now. Quantum physics, not going to too much details, one of the main, the two main things about quantum physics is that every object in the universe has two properties. It has a particle property and it has a wave property, basically. Anything, right from an atom uh, to a human being, to this earth, to this galaxy, stars, objects, everything in the universe has a particle property and it has a wave property there. The other fact which uh, quantum physics talks about is that in the presence of an observer or observing system, the wave collapses to become an object, basically. So it's very important to answer the sequence. The wave part comes first, then the object, uh, the particle property comes up. The wave prop, uh, particle, uh, uh, wave, the wave part collapses in the presence of an observer or observing system, and it collapses to become a particle. So it clearly shows that the wave part comes first, and then the particle part comes there. And where is the wave part? The only place the wave parts are of the universe is in your mind, and that part collapses in the presence of the observing system to become the universe out there. So quantum physics clearly uh, supports the idea that the wave part comes first and then the particle part comes first, second. And with this logic, it does show that projection is the only truth for the universe basically. Let's take the last reason now about, one minute, let me drink some water. The question to ask is, are we looking at the same objects? It may be a very strange question to ask, but the fact is we are maybe looking at the same objects, but we are looking at different versions of the same object. The version of, of the objects are never the same. Just to give an example, if you're looking at a tree, which is 100 feet away, and your friend <coughs> is standing at 500 feet away from the uh, tree, <coughs> So they may be looking at the same tree, but they're looking at different versions of the same tree because light is going to take less time uh, to reach 100 feet. So they, he's seeing a more, um, uh, what do you call, 
a new version of the tree and light is going to take 500 feet uh, to reach the uh, your friend who's standing there light since light has taken more time he's seeing a much older version of the tree so you're seeing different versions of the same tree so every object this is not a, you can apply this to all the objects around you so each one of us are seeing different versions of the same object so nobody is seeing exactly the same object there because to see the same object you have got to be exactly at 100 feet away and since you're not at 100 feet you are 500 feet you're not seeing exactly the same object there you're seeing different versions of the object there so this clearly shows that each one of us when we are seeing objects out there we are seeing different versions of the same objects because the distances may be different even a few millimeter difference out there would indicate we are seeing a different version of the same object there so it clearly indicates that since the objects you are seeing are different from each other your objects are different my objects are different different versions of the same ob of same object it does indicate that each one of us are projecting uh, the universe out there so we have seen in many different ways that projection is the only truth we have seen it by einstein theory of relativity which clearly shows that projection is part of the theory because time slows down differently for different people so it does indicate we are creating our own space basically even by logic we saw each one has his own space starting point then we saw the hubble's constant which can prove mathematically that what the framework which i mentioned to you is the only correct way to understand space by quantum physics also we saw that each one is creating their own space because the wave part comes first and that wave part collapses to become the particle and the wave part part functions in the mind only and lastly we saw that the objects we have each one sees sees different objects nobody sees exactly the same objects they have different different versions of the same objects this indicates that our own projection has its own mix of objects and everyone has got a different mix of objects that only highlights and shows that projection is the only truth of this universe so now that we have understood that the projection is the only uh, truth there let's try to understand how this projection is done by the by the mind we all know about a digital projector the digital projector has two major components one is the light source and one is the digital content and the light, digital content is uh, is projected out uh, uh, into a screen and that's how the projector works so mind also almost is like a it is a projector and it has those two components one is a bulb of awareness which is like the light source and then it has content which comes from the five senses and what the what content which comes from the five senses is what is projected out there let's try to understand the bulb of awareness in a little bit more detail try to understand where does this bulb of awareness reside so where does the bulb of awareness reside we all know all thoughts all experiences happen in the mind not self if you analyze an experience we have continuous experience taking place right from the morning to the evening we have different experiences coming through in our mind there if you analyze your experiences it must have two major components the experience is equal to awareness plus the forms of objects basically so these are the two different components which make up awareness because you are always aware of experience you can never say i had an experience and i'm not aware of it so awareness is a very key ingredient of experience there and then you have forms the forms can change you can have the form coming sometime from your eyes sometime your form is coming from your ears from your touch nose smell you got the five senses the forms are coming from the five senses those five uh, uh, forms are superimposed on this awareness and then you get an experience so the awareness is already present in the mind it's like a bulb hanging around in your mind and your mind is full of awareness and the forms come from different uh, 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 senses and it superimposes itself on awareness and that's how you get an experience basically so the bulb of awareness is present in every mind you have a bulb of awareness i have a bulb of awareness every living being who has a mind it has awareness in built in and that awareness is like a bulb which is shining 
awareness basically just like a sun is shining light this bulb is shining awareness and when the form uh, superimposes itself on this awareness you get an experience basically so that's how this uh, bulb of ex experience a uh, bulb of awareness works basically because it is and this bulb of awareness is your is something like the projector is the it needs a bulb and this bulb of awareness is what is providing there so this light of awareness is what is creating this universe there so let's see how exactly the projection takes place in the mind there's a very interesting a chapter in panchadashi if anyone has read that uh, written by the famous saint from the 14th or 15th century vidyanarana and he in the sixth chapter has compared the universe what you see outside to a painting basically and he has analyzed a painting needs four ingredients basically it needs a canvas and those days when his in his book is written is made of cloth basically the canvas is made of cloth and this canvas needs hardening and they used to put uh, some sort of starch uh, behind the cloth to give it some hardening so that you can do the painting and once that hardening of uh, the canvas is done you make a line drawing and once a line drawing is done you add color to complete the painting this is a four step process which takes place uh, to create a painting there you first need a canvas then you harden the canvas then you make a line drawing on the canvas and then you add color uh to finish the painting there this is exactly what happens uh with the projection of the universe out there you need a canvas and what is the canvas the space out there we see is the canvas basically and then you harden the space with energy and we will see all the steps in more detail and then in that uh space or what you call the subtle you put subtle objects there uh, which is the wave form of the objects there and once the subtle objects have been placed on that uh, uh, space uh, uh, space then you add awareness to it just like you add color uh, to what you call uh, uh, to the painting you add awareness to the subtle objects and that's what creates the projection basically so you can see what the painting uh, the what uh, the projection what takes place is exactly like a painting which is taking place you create space then you harden the space with energy then you add subtle objects there and then you add awareness to the subtle objects uh, to complete the projection basically so let's go through how is space created so how is space created to understand how space is created you need to understand the difference between space time and space space we see all we all see space out there as as uh, as uh, out there but space time is a terminology uh which is used by einstein he created this terminology uh, which is a a fabric on which everything rests there this so there is a fabric which is made of space time and this word space time creates a lot of confusion there because you start looking for space time in space there is no space time in space because space you only have distances actually the space time the correct way to understand space time it is only made of time so this fabric which einstein talks about and he also mentioned it is made of time only so this space time we see this diagram out here so this sort of it's a sort of fabric uh, which is there and this fabric is made out of of time so this uh, space time or I, i would like to call it the time fabric maybe to, to reduce the confusion i will call this a time fabric so this time fabric has a starting point and ending point the ending point is the 13.7 billion years which is the end of the outer edge of the universe and the starting point of this fabric is the t is equal to 0 which is the new within you so this fabric is made of time basically and where does this fabric reside it doesn't reside in space because space is only got distances is only got three dimensions x y and z and like einstein mentioned space time or time is the fourth dimension there and so where does the fourth dimension reside we will not go into detail here i have explained this in many other webinars where time resides is within your mind basically so mind is a source where time resides so this time fabric or space time fabric is resides only in your mind and this time is is not continuous time is made of small small increments basically so this increments is what the fabric you see they all small small increments made out here and that time fabric is residing within your 
mind basically within your within your in the mind we also mentioned earlier what is that the is that there's an infinite energy lying in your inner core we explained in an earlier slide because the photons don't travel and photon anything traveling at the speed of light has infinite energy and this infinite energy is sitting within your inner core so what happened is there's some part of this infinite energy is used to stretch out time it's amazing that this um, time energy which is there within the infinite energy which is within you a part of the energy is used to stretch out time just the way you uh, stretch out rubber band when you stretch out time what happens you create space one second of the space time fabric becomes 186000 miles of space basically so the energy which is what science is looking for dark energy they call it so the dark energy is what is really stretching out time and this dark energy is within you and is stretching out time moment it stretches out time uh, uh, one second of that time becomes 186000 miles and all the space which is the age of the universe is 13.7 million billion years when you stretch out all that uh, time you get all the space out there basically that is how space is created space is created by stretching out uh, time basically so one second of time becomes 186000 miles of space basically so once you the space is created you need to harden the space there so what happens is that at every nodal point in this fabric there you see there are nodal points at all intersection there is a node point there a part of the energy which is within you interacts with this uh, time fabric so when you have uh, energy interacting with time what happens you have the electromagnetic uh, spectrum comes out so all the different frequencies of time and uh, energy when you interact you have the spectrum like for example you have frequencies right from uh, 300 kilo kilohertz to 303 into 10 to the 21 hertz gamma rays x rays ultraviolet rays microwave rays. all these points are at each nodal point because the time is interacting with this uh, fabric and each nodal point has this energy built in and that's a vacuum energy which uh, time uh, what you call science talks about because it's inside the surface of the time fabric so the time fabric is vibrating with energy basically all the nodal points has the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum at each nodal point right from the radio frequencies to the uh, gamma rays are all at this uh, location basically so this uh, fabric of uh, space is got so much energy basically it's uh, all the is full coating of the uh, fabric and when you stretch this energy out uh, you have the full space has energy in built on it and that's what you call the hardening of the space time with energy the next step is to place the subtle objects basically the subtle objects are uh, at uh, uh, like i mentioned to the subtle objects are in your mind because gross objects are in your uh, out there the subtle objects are made of wave and they are placed appropriately on the fabric basically like for example the sun is placed 8 minutes away on this fabric because light takes 8 minutes to reach you the moon is placed 3 seconds uh, on this fabric because light takes 3 seconds away and then you have uh, a tree which may be 600 feet away you have placed at 6 uh, milliseconds away microseconds away and another tree so all the different objects which you see outside they are placed on this fabric basically time fabric and this fabric is still in a subtle form and once that picture is complete then you add awareness to it is like adding paint uh, to the uh, uh, to the painting and once you had awareness to it and that uh, stretching of the time is already taken place space has been created space has been hardened and then objects have been placed there and when you add awareness the projection is complete basically so it's an amazing process all a uh, projection takes place on a continuous basis because each is almost like a frame which is taking place every a uh, frame like a, a projector has uh, so many frames 30 frames per second the same way the mind is projecting out the universe on a continuous basis basically each one is like a frame coming out and it gives you the sense of motion gives you a sense of everything there so this is how exactly the frame 
science, uh, uh, the, the actual projection takes place. And that is the only truth. It's what science is teaching about falling on the retina, and it's, it's got so many loopholes that you cannot fully be convinced that's how it works. But Vedanta has been very clear that each one of us is projecting this universe. And here I've given in a very scientific way how the projection works, how the space is created, how the energy is hardened, and how the subtle objects are placed, and how awareness fills up the full area to create the projection, to complete the projection there. So when you add awareness, the projection is complete. So you have the, the, the what do you call, uh, the light of awareness filling up the, uh, the subtle objects. And when that is done, the projection is complete, basically. So just to conclude, the current perception, uh, uh, perception process taught by science has many limitations. So it, it is a fact that each one of us projects their own universe, and that's the only truth. Science has not understood this because it is, uh, still believes uh, the process, what uh, I mentioned earlier, what science teaches us. But I've just shown you this full of limitations there. So it's projection, and if you conclude, like I mentioned to you, if you interpret the Einstein theory of relativity properly, it does indicate that projection is the only truth. So each one of us is projecting the own universe. We have our own content. There's a universal content there, uh, which has everything, all the information of the universe. Each one of us takes a subset of this, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, of this uh, universe in a waveform, and we project it out. When you change our uh, direction to look, a new set of information is in your mind, and we are projecting that universe out there. And when you look 180 degrees uh, opposite, uh, a new subset comes into your mind, and you're projecting that. So that continuous projection is taking place. And it's amazing that millions of people, not million, billions and billions of people are projecting the universe continuously. You can see the processing power of, of, the, uh, of the projector the, uh, the cosmic projector, and each mind is projecting a small subset of that. You wonder sometimes what's the speed and what's the size of that, of that uh, pro projector. It's amazing. But that's the only fact there. Just to conclude, I'll just mention, introduce my book again. So many of you may have known about my book. The book I recently wrote is Science Meets uh, uh, Vedanta. This book has 70, 37 essays, and it has 345 pages. It's available on Amazon and Flipkart all around the world and is also available on uh, uh, Barnes & Noble online. In India, it's also available in all the major crossword stores. It comes as a Kindle ebook. It comes as a Kindle Unlimited paperback and hardcover. So that's my address, uh, giantastaminteractive.com. If you have any questions, if you ever want to contact me, I'd like to, I would be more than happy to answer these questions. With this, I'd like to stop. I'll, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Maya? Maya, I can't hear you. I'm John. Yes. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So, um, when I was checking earlier, there was just one question. And uh, it says, it's from Manmohan Chaube. And he says, percept it's more of a comment, really. Perception is through all the senses, not just through the light or the eye. Not just through the light, through light or the eye, or just through the eye. It can be through anything else. Yes, it's, that's correct. Yeah. But senses come, I just mentioned, because that's, we are so used to the perception through the eyes to understand. In sound, which comes through the ear, the same logic applies. The sound comes through the eardrums, comes through the... Uh, it, it, uh, basically, it has to, the form has to come from the five different senses and it superimposes itself on awareness to be aware of it sort of thing. It can come through your skin, it can come through your taste, it can come through your nose. It's a different sense organs come through different paths. But finally, when it reaches your mind, it has to superimpose on awareness to be aware of it. If you want to be aware of sound, if you want to be aware of the smell, uh, the, uh, this nose has to, the information has to come through your nose and when it superimposes on awareness, then you get uh, the awareness of that smell, basically. So it doesn't matter because we are so used to talking about visually. So that's the reason I took the word of light falling. But every sense organist has its different ways of reaching these, uh, the organs. And the projection of that, again, it's all everything is projected out, basically. You know, the sound, 
everything is projected out. The smell, everything is projected out by the projection system, basically. Does that, that, was the, that was the only question. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, yeah when you are talking about placements of objects in the space time fabric, yeah. my question is that does this placement of objects in the space time fabric the same for everybody? Because some, my question is because we see or we project the universe differently, right? So, but then we see subsets of that universe. So but what I'm saying, the original, uh, the beginning, right? The, the, the objects that are in the space find, are they fixed? I mean. No, they're not fixed because uh, that it's very dynamic because everything is growing in the space-time fabric. For every object has got time and it is, time is making grow. But just to give an example now, if you have a friend uh, who's sitting on Mars and you are sitting on Earth, mm -hmm. uh, he will, you will see a, eight minute old sun because light has taken eight minutes to reach you. The person sitting on Mars, he will see a 13 minutes old version of the sun because light takes 13 minutes to reach you. So when his space-time fabric is created, his sun will be placed 13 minutes away on that fabric, basically. When you are looking at the sun, your sun will be placed eight minutes on the fabric, basically. Mm -hmm. So every object that way has got Actually, uh, it's, it sounds very complicated because, mm -hmm. but actually the way it works, I, what I understood, uh, that's my understanding, there's a full cosmic, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, a waveform, mm -hmm. which contains all the information of all the suns. Mm -hmm. There would be, a, the, right now, if you take the sun now, the sun has a history of 4.5 billion years old. Mm -hmm. So all the versions of the sun is available in the cosmic waveform. So right from zero uh, uh, current version to 13.5, uh, 13.7, uh, 4.5, which is the uh, age of the, uh, of the sun. That's mm -hmm. available uh, as a sun's waveform. So the waveform which comes to the person on Mars would be from that waveform of the sun, he'll pick up 13 minute version of the sun and place it on 13 minutes away on the fabric. Someone else who's sitting 5 million light years away, 5 million years away, uh, his he'll see a light will take 5 million years to reach him from the sun to reach him. So his fabric will pick up a sun, which is 5 million uh, years old and he'll place it appropriately on the fabric. So the cosmic waveform is the same and the cosmic waveform has all the information, both um, the different versions of the sun and different uh, objects are all together, put together as a one cosmic waveform. So you almost like cutting slices of a cake and you pick up a, yeah, a slice that's, and you... that's what my question that means there is a cosmic waveform which has all the objects placements there right but what we're looking at is just subsets of it, is it? yes and each one is uh, each one is unique you can't have the same subset nobody else can see the subset because yeah, because they're in not, different position because they won't have the same distance or even you may have the same distance you may not have the same angle uh, mm. so it can unless you're not sitting in the same location mm. you cannot have the same uh, uh, view basically, you know. Okay, so then so my you, question, then my question is: Is the cosmic waveform just yes, now, as you say, is also continuous? Is is dynamic? Is yes, it? it is dynamic. It's been upgraded continuously. If, suppose someone uh, breaks a branch of a of a tree, mm -hmm. that uh, cosmic waveform has been updated straight away. So it's a uh, uh, if you because it's the Earth is universe is changing uh, time as time is flowing, mm -hmm. the universe is continuously uh, upgrading itself, changing itself. So the cosmic waveform is continuously being upgraded. It has all the information, everything in the universe, just like Google map has all the information of all the roads. Cosmic waveform has all the information of every nook and corner of the universe. And it has the versions also of the, all the versions of the, for example, your, you may be, what are your ages? Your, all the different versions of you are available in your, uh, your waveform. So mm -hmm. someone is seeing you from the moon, they put a telescope, someone seeing you from, uh, from Mars, if they can zoom into you, they'll see a different version of you because your light takes that much time to reach you sort of from that particular thing. Thanks. Does it, does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's an amazing concept, but that's the uh, a fact which is uh, science needs to understand and uh, in, incorporate in their thinking, basically. Okay, there's another question here. Uh, from Vineet Mishra. He says, I want to know the difference between bliss and sukha. Yeah. Bliss and sukha is a, a technical term which is used in Satchit Ananda. Uh, that comes from uh, Satchit Ananda. 
bliss uh, the the way it works out is that the the word bliss can have can create confusion it can under, people get the feeling that they're talking about uh, happiness there basically because bliss comes a word when uh, sachinanda is bliss because it is complete uh, because it is full it's self sufficient something which is full and complete is doesn't need anything else so when it doesn't need anything it is full of it's self it's self sufficient doesn't need anything else to be so it is fully happy bliss sukha i don't know uh, um, i i don't understand the word sukha how exactly it means because the way i look at it is that the bulb of awareness which i mentioned to you that bulb also radiates happiness basically because such is ananda uh, such chit is uh, awareness and ananda is uh, what you call happiness in a way just to in a loose term so so the happiness part also has been radiated out by this bulb basically so if you interact with that happiness you absorb that happiness but because of our ignorance that happiness comes in a very distorted form and we don't feel the full happiness version of that i don't know if i have answered your question because it's that is very small difference between the two can can i say something yeah to, to answer this a little i mean this is my attempt to answer it i think that uh, when you talk about sat chidananda which is in your mind sat sat is reality existence what is there and chit is awareness that is everything that you know and see and hear so and then the th- so that means one is in the physical dimension that is sat it's reality it's what you it's what is there so that's the physical dimension then you have awareness awareness is like subtle dimension so but then a human being has subtleness he, there is materiality there is subtleness and there is feeling that's the third thing about us about awareness so feeling in all forms is what is ananda should be translated as instead it is tra- translated as happiness because when you become a pure person you will feel only bliss but the thing is that all ty- all types of feelings are generated by that by that sachidananda may and I, this is my attempt to answer it i don't know if it I, makes any sense yeah. to you Man may I make a short comment on the satchidanand yeah please uh, as i understand it as i understand it this is the property so to say of the brahman and when we realize brahman then we feel that uh, bliss which is uh, the anand part of it and as you said about the projection the the sat part of it the knowledge part of it since that becomes total within us then this projection becomes real we know that this world is not outside us this world is actually inside us and we are just projecting it on that screen that you talked about how the canvas yeah correct correct i agree i agree with what you said thank you manmoth for adding your awesome. comments thank you any other question anyone has maya or that's all i can see here. let me see uh no okay what is the practical applicability of this scientific concept this is anand gurie yeah the practical is it you need to understand science correctly basically science what it is teaching you is not very accurate basically and uh, science in many ways is not understanding the concepts of vedanta if you understand the concepts of vedanta your outlook towards uh the universe changes basically when you say you are projecting the universe you look at the universe in a different way then uh what science is teaching there is a full universe there and you just uh, part of the universe there so uh, practical uh, implication is that you need to have the correct understanding of what how science works and that's what my focus has been in my book also science meets vedanta trying to show different ways where science can learn for vedanta there's so many aspects there even motion how does motion happen you really don't move at all so all these small small aspects of science need to understand and because science is also finally trying to find the theory of everything there and they cannot find the theory of everything unless they don't understand your innermost core because everything else is depending on your inner core all the objects are dependent on the inner core unless you don't understand the inner core you cannot understand the objects there and science is struggling they're trying to find 
they're building those big machines and uh, the LHC in uh, Switzerland, trying to make it bigger and bigger and bigger and spending more money, trying to find the theory of everything. They will never, never, never find it unless they don't understand your inner core. The answer is the inner core, basically. Once you understand the inner core, then you can understand how these objects are made in this universe there. So that way, it's very important to understand your uh, Vedanta and inner core. Does that answer your question? Uh, can I, I ask you a question, please? Yes, yes Kaveri, thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah thank you. See, uh, probably I didn't, uh, I, I didn't join in the beginning. I, we joined after 15 minutes. So <clears throat> can I know the uh, relationship of this physics or science uh, with the Vedanta concept of today's topic? Vedanta is, uh, is it very difficult to difficult to answer. It will take time to answer. If it is like that, we'll talk another day. No, Vedanta because science, uh, uh, because basically uh, uh, Vedanta teaches your inner more course core yeah. is, is a source for everything in the universe. The universe yeah. depends on this inner core, basically. All the objects you see, everything depends on the inner core, basically. And Vedanta mm -hmm. is trying to teach us the inner core. And science is what science is doing is trying to uh, understand objects out there in the universe. They're trying to find atoms. They're trying to find breakdown atoms. But mm -hmm. they will now find the reality unless they don't understand the inner core there. Because everything else, the atoms and everything is, is built by the inner core, basically. So, so okay. science, that way science is dependent on the inner core, basically, you know. And so if the mm. science was to progress, they have to understand the inner core. Mm. Okay. To me again, it has been mind-boggling. <laughs> and then I say, Jayant and Maya, it's exactly made for each other. <laughs> <laughs> Just to... Just to tell you, everyone, uh, Sachi was my first, uh, my boss in Philips many, many years back. So nice to see you. Nice to see you, Sachi, again. Talked about Sat Chit Ananda. And your name <laughs> yeah. is that, Sachi Ananda. I never understood your name when I stood to know you in Philips. So now I you know your name now. <laughs> go ahead. There might be so many people asking questions. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sachi. Thank you. All the best, thank Kaveri. You. Yeah. Maya, thank you. Okay, thank you. Nice to see you. I have never yeah. met you in person. Hopefully, we'll meet. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think we will close with that because I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'll look once more. I'll just check. Um, no, no, sorry, sorry. Where am I? Okay, no, there's no more questions. So I will close with this. So thanks everyone for attending. I hope you found the session helpful. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. So which chapter is uh, in your book connected with today's topic? topic? There is, there's a, if you go through this, uh, uh, there's a thing called projection of the universe. Projection. Okay. A, you'll okay. find it there. It'll be, I think... I can't remember the chapter, but it is there. Full chapter is okay. there. Yeah, you'll find okay, it there. Okay, because I mean, I read the quantum physics and the relationship between the world and the projection. And uh, of course, let me go through. It is there. The full chapter explaining exactly what I've discussed is there as a chapter itself. Okay, okay. I'll do that. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, bye everyone.